Hi, everyone. Um, here we are with chapter three. All right. Uh, and this is going to be a really important one. It's going to be a difficult and challenging one for some of you. Um, first off, there's a lot of material here, and it is absolutely necessary. Your ability to uh, uh, to successfully complete the rest of the content in this class, to learn the rest of this content, it heavily depends upon your understanding of, of what we're going to be discussing today with supply and demand. It is the central model around which almost all other economic theory evolves. Um, so it is critical that you understand the things that we're going to talk about here. Feel free to find additional sources. Anything you're not understanding, um, look on YouTube, whatever you want to do, whatever you need to do to be sure you understand this. Of course, you can always email me and uh, uh, visit me during office hours if you want to. Um, uh, those are That's certainly available to you, but it's important that you understand this, okay? There'll be a lot of questions on your test related to supply and demand. And this is really going to expand, cover three chapters. Today, we're going to introduce supply, demand, and equilibrium. Okay, and then um, on chapter four, we're going to talk about the applications of supply and demand to different markets. Uh, and then in chapter five, we're going to talk about something called elasticity. Um, and that what that is will become clear once we start uh, moving through this material. Okay, so before we get into actual supply and demand uh, information, let's talk a little bit about uh, markets. Okay, what a market is. So a market is uh, a place where um, consumers and producers come together to buy and sell goods and services at a negotiated price. Now, you may not think you're negotiating your prices that you buy stuff on, but you're not the only consumer. And the negotiation really occurs in the context of a market where it was supply and demand, as we will see in a little bit. So there are different types of economic systems, to be, to be clear. Uh, there's a market economy. And a market economy is one in which um, economic decisions are not based on government planners, right? That there's generally no intervention by the government. Um, uh, this is what we think of as being decentralized, right? Uh, resources are owned by private individuals and businesses supply the goods and services based on consumer demand, okay? Another really important idea in this context is the idea that we want our markets to be competitive. What are the advantages of a competitive market? There are three of them, in my opinion. Um, and two of them are related. In a competitive market, the average business has no real ability to control the price they sell their good for. The market determines that price. The market's going to tell them. This is what we call, uh, the, these companies are what we call price takers. They have to take the price the market gives them. Only monopolies are true price makers, but even that's more limited than you might imagine. Take my micro class and we can get into that more. But suffice it to say for our purposes here today that um, when we talk about uh, competition, we are talking about a, 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 a market in which companies are required to accept whatever price supply and demand is telling them. Is the is the price? If they change their prices, they're just going they're going to lose their market share. If they increase their price, they, and they can they can change their price. Don't misunderstand me. But if they do so, consumers are just going to go get that product with somebody else selling it for less. They're going to lose market share. Um, if they can't uh, produce it at a price below what the market clearing rate is, which is what we call that, then they're going to have to go out of business. It happens all the time. Businesses come and go. When they leave, that market share is going to get distributed to the companies that remain. They're going to start showing a profit, which is going to attract more businesses back in the market, and it goes back and forth like this all the time. Okay, So that's one of the big, use, the, the big reasons we like competitive markets, is because it takes control of pricing and gives it to um, uh, consumers um, uh, in, the, in the market. Okay? Um, collectively, not individually, obviously. Another good reason, if, if you're the producer of a good and you're, and you're wanting to sell it to people and other people are already making that good, why would people buy it from you instead of these other folks? I can only think of two reasons. Um, either you're making it less expensive or you are making it better. If those, either of those things are true, then you have, then, then you can uh, sell your product. Um, but it's important to understand that a competitive market is, is one in which those things are incentivized. You are incentivized to make it cheaper. You are incentivized to make it better, be innovative. That's what competition does. Okay? That's what competition does. All right. And a free economy is one, again, where uh, the government does not intervene in any way. Um, 
we really don't have too many of those, right? Um, then there, there's a planned economy. And the planned economy is what you find in Venezuela, in North Korea, um, Cuba. Um, this is an economy where economic decisions are passed down from government authority. The old Soviet Union had this for short. Um, the, the resources are owned by the government. Um, so uh, businesses, resources, those are all government managed, right? They're all owned by the government. And the government decides what goods and services will be produced, what prices will be charged for them. The government decides what methods of production will be used and how much workers will be paid. Um, uh, and, and there are there are variations of this theme. Um, you know, we've renamed socialism to democratic socialism or something to give to make it more palatable to people who who aren't uh, uh, who who don't understand uh, that you're just repackaging uh, a system that has never worked anywhere. Um, people point to the Nordic countries and stuff like this as evidence that it does work. Um, expanded welfare state is not socialism. Um, and we can get into all the different multitude of reasons why it's a bad idea here. It works there. Um, and there'll come a time and a place where maybe we can get into some of that. And if you have that question, feel free to schedule a, uh, uh, some time with me in office hours uh, and, and you'll get an earful. Nonetheless, um, uh, this is socialism or communism, if you will. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. That's a planned economy or a command economy. Um, that's one where the government decides these things. Okay? Uh, and one of the reasons why they don't work very well is because it's inefficient. It's hard for governments to know exactly how much they should make and when. This is why under uh, many of the uh, communist leaders of the past, uh, in both China and Russia, um, a lot of people starved to death. Um, they went hungry. Uh, because the government did not plan very well. Okay. Um, the primary distinction between free and command economies is the degree to which the government determines what can be produced and what prices will be charged. Um, most economies in the real world are, in fact, mixed. They combine elements of both. Think of it as a, uh, um, a spectrum. Right, and you have free on one end, command on the other, and almost every country can be placed somewhere along that line. We are arguably closer to the free side than the command side, but a, a country, uh, you know, in Europe might be a little bit further that way. Canada might be a little bit further that way. Not all the way by any stretch, but certainly more towards the command side than we are, arguably. Um, and so uh, that's really where most people, most countries fall as far as their economic system. All right, that brings us to. Demand. All right. So demand is the real, there's two ways of thinking about this. All right. There's a demand curve and a demand schedule. Demand is just the relationship between the price of a good or service and how much of that good or service someone is willing and able to buy. That's what demand uh, models for us. Okay. Uh, the price is simply what the buyer pays for a, a, a unit of a good or service. Um, and quantity demanded is the total number of units of a good or service consumers wish to purchase at any given price. Okay? So it's really important that you get this. There is a very critical distinction between demand and quantity demanded. Those are not the same thing. They differ in two very important ways that we will get to in a moment. Okay? This brings us to the law of demand. The law of demand says that as prices rise, quantity demanded falls, and vice versa. Right? They're moving in the opposite direction. That's known as an inverse relationship or an indirect relationship may sometimes even be referred to as a negative relationship. That is why your, de your demand curve is downward sloping, which we will get to in a moment. Two different ways that you can model demand, a demand schedule, which is nothing more than a, 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 a table that shows at this price consumers are, are willing to buy this much so forth and so on. So one column is price, the other column is quantity demanded. At this price, consumers are willing to buy this many. That sort of thing. Okay? So here is, for example, a demand schedule. Alright? And you will notice in this schedule, uh, over the left-hand side, as you move down the, the that column, you'll see that prices are rising. Now look over to your left, you'll note, or to your right, excuse me, in the next column, you'll notice as you work down that quantity demanded is falling. All right, so price is going up, quantity demanded is coming down. Hence, law of demand. That's always the case. Okay? All right. 
And then you have a demand curve, which is nothing more than a graphical representation of your demand schedule. Generally speaking, when we graph our supply and demand curves, they're just going to be generalized curves. You're just going to draw a big L um, and label the vertical axis price and the horizontal axis Q for quantity demanded. And then you can just draw a downward sloping curve or line. Oftentimes, supply and demand, we talk about it in linear, even though it's not. It just simplifies things. Okay, so yeah, here we have a demand curve. Notice again that it's downward sloping. Um, you're going to have to be able to read uh, a demand curve. You're going to have to be able to say at a dollar eighty, five hundred, and there it is right here, spelled out for you next to it. Okay, so you take this. This is this is the information that was provided in that curve. Here's the price. Here's the quantity demanded. That was the information that was given to you in the table in the in the, in the demand schedule and you can plot it to create a demand curve, right? Again, usually we generalize these. We don't actually have the points that you plot and then connect them, but that's okay. There's a really important point to be made when you talk about um, economics. There's this idea that we're going to change the value of some variable by a single unit and see what happens to some other variable or variables, right? Generally speaking, we're only going to be changing one thing at one time and seeing what happens to some other one, some other single thing. Um, if price changes, what happens to demand? If price changes, what happens to supply? If price changes, what happens to equilibrium price? What happens to equilibrium uh, quantity? We'll see all this, all right? Um, this I, and the fact that we're only changing one thing means that everything else is being held constant. One of the reasons why much of the economic conversations don't go the way we would like them to, the reason why sometimes uh, economic policy doesn't work out the way we say it does, is because uh, setting aside the incredible complexity of the economy, other things change and affect its output. Nothing we do in the economy is going to happen instantaneous. Um, and other factors, while we're waiting for this effect to take hold, other variables are going to be changing at the same time that make it virtually, uh, that can make it very difficult to predict the final outcome. However, for the purposes of our discussions, we are going to make it a, a critical assumption about our economy. This is known as ceteris paribus. It's a Latin phrase, other things being equal. And it means that nothing else is changing. Um, you change one variable in a function, say demand for some product, and we assume everything else is held constant. When we do that, we can predict with, with precision what's going to happen in the market. Okay? Um, for our purposes, supply and demand at this, at this point is simply a relationship between two and only two variables, and every other variable is held equal. They don't change. They're the same as they were when we started. Um, because supply, the laws of supply and demand uh, may not hold the way we say they do if we're not uh, making this assumption. This is why sometimes the way we predict the out outcome of some policy choice being made doesn't always happen the way we want it to or think it will because there are other factors that are intervening. Ceteris paribus is not a real phenomenon. We made this up. We're allowed to do that. We're economists. That's what we do all the time. What are some things that affect the demand curve? What are some things that affect the demand curve? Um, there, before I get into this, I want to take a moment here and discuss the difference that I mentioned earlier between demand and a change in quantity demanded. Change in demand and a change in quantity demanded are two very different things. They differ in two critical uh, and important ways. What causes the change is different for a change in demand and a change in quantity demanded. And how each one is modeled, graphed in supply and demand. How, how it looks when you model uh, this change varies depending on whether it is a change in demand or a change in quantity demanded. So let's start with the first way these differ. What causes each of these? A change in demand is caused by one thing and one thing only. A change in the price of the underlying good. For our purposes in this class, that will always be assumed. The ch a change in demand is caused by one thing and only one thing, 
a change in the price of the underlying good. Please remember that. If it's something other than the price of the good being modeled in supply and demand. If we're talking about demand for TVs and they're saying the price of uh, resistors just went up, that's not what we're modeling. That's not a change in the price of television. So therefore, it's not a change in demand, a, a change in quantity demanded. A change in quantity demanded is caused by one thing and only one thing. A change in the price of the underlying good. Period. All right. A change in demand, on the other hand, is caused by a change in anything not price related. We call these non-price determinants of demand. Generally, depending on, there's lists vary in what gets included and what gets bundled with other things. But I generally count six. And they spell out a mnemonic device I've used in my classes, uh, which is just a memory device to help you remember what these are. Um, and it spells out the word insect. Non-price determinants of demand. I, income. A change in your income can affect demand. Um, income goes up, demand goes up. Income comes down, demand comes down. But there's a catch. There's a catch, and we're going to get into this. Not all goods are the same. We have two different types of goods. We have normal goods and inferior goods. So when your income goes up, demand for inferior goods is going to go down. Demand for normal goods is going to go up. If your income goes down, then demand for inferior goods is going to go up. You're going to buy the cheaper stuff, the less the, the stuff that's not as good, but it's less expensive, and you just lost some income. So demand uh, consumption preference will shift over to inferior goods, right? And uh, uh, demand for normal goods is going to go down. That's the trick with income. That's I and insect. N, number of consumers. S, what we call substitute goods, the price of a substitute good, right? I like uh, um, coffee and I like tea. Um, and the law, the price of coffee goes up. I like them the same, but I don't buy them both. One's a substitute for the other. And I have either one, no real preference for, for which. And if the price of coffee goes up, we know from the law of demand, price of a good goes up, quantity demanded of that good's coming down. So if the price of coffee goes up, I'm buying less coffee. So says the law of demand. That means I'm going to shift my consumption preference to a reasonable substitute, like tea. So the price of coffee goes up, not the price of tea. We're looking at supply. We're looking at the demand of tea. Price of coffee goes up. That's a different thing. Price of tea uh, didn't change. It stayed the same. So I'm going to shift my preference over to tea. Demand for tea is going to increase. Substitute goods. The price of a substitute good. E expectations, consumer expectations. This will play a role in almost everything we do, and there's no real quick, easy way to explain expectations. You just have to, uh, uh, you know, take look at the context in which these expectations are changing. Uh, typically, expectations revolve around two things. Uh, consumers' expectations about the price of a good and about their income. All right, if they expect their income is going to increase next month, they may put off that purchase now in favor of buying it when they have more money, so demand may fall. That kind of thing. Demand in the short term, anyway. And then C, insect, I-N-S-E-C-T. Uh, C is um, C is complementary goods. Um, and these are goods you buy together, like shoes and socks. Right? Some of us wear socks. We're not savages. Um, so shoes and socks. These are complementary goods. If the price of shoes go up, low demand says I'm buying less shoes. What does that do to the demand for socks? If I'm buying less shoes and I buy them together, I'm going to be buying less socks. Price of shoes go up, demand for socks is coming down. That kind of thing is, uh, is, is decreasing. All right. Last one is tea, taste and preferences. Here again, it just depends on uh, the context. You're just going to have to kind of suss that out on your own. We'll give you some resources to help with that too. All right. So let's see how the, this, this book does it. Um, uh, demand curve can be affected by the willingness to purchase, which is the desire to buy. depends on what economists call taste and preferences. Um, uh, if you don't, it, it, there is some, you know, I've had people tell me that uh, if, price was zero, everybody would want it. Well, that's not true. Uh, this is why you cannot measure demand for a good for a free good. You can't measure demand for a free good. If it's free, there's no way to know exactly how much uh, consumers are going to buy of it. 
Let me give you an example. Uh, I don't care uh, that you're giving lettuce away. <coughs> free lettuce. I don't like lettuce. I'm not going to get any lettuce. Making it free is not going to make it more attractive to me. I don't not eat lettuce because it costs too much. I don't eat lettuce because I hate it. I'm not a rabbit. I don't know. Um, so, uh, that's the, that demanded, uh, demanded a price of zero is, um, is almost impossible to quantify. There's no telling how much is going to be demanded at, at a price of zero. So, um, keep that in mind as we work through it. Then there's the ability to purchase, which suggests that income is important. Um, the single greatest, not the only one, but certainly a, a significant a determinant of consumption of what you, of your decision to buy is based on your ability to pay for it, which is your income, and specifically uh, your income after taxes, what we call disposable income. All right. So uh, there's price of related goods. That's what I was talking about, substitutes and complements. The size of the composition of the population. There's my uh, number of consumers in an insect. All right. And then, um, and this is how a change in demand gets modeled. A change in demand is a shift of my entire demand curve, left or right. A rightward shift is an increase in demand. A leftward shift is a decrease in demand. Very important. Rightward, increase. Leftward, decrease. Um, some of the other factors that might drive, I, I, seems to be somewhat redundant. They put these in here, but there's chase and preferences again. There's that number of consumers, right? Price of related goods, and then expectations about future prices and future income, to be frank. All right? So it's really important. One of the, those key differences between a change in demand and a change in quantity demanded, how this model completely affects that. A change in quantity demanded is simply moving, is a change in which, uh, uh, where you're at in the supply or demand schedule, right? So if you've changed the price of the good, remember a change in quantity demanded is caused by one thing and one thing only, a change in the price of the uh, underlying good. If that price changes, then you have a change in quantity demanded. Um, and all you're saying is, you're at, remember, the demand schedule says that this price consumers buy this much. So you're changing where you're at in the demand schedule. Well, since the demand curve is nothing but taking the demand schedule and plotting those points and connecting them, all you've done with it, with a change in quantity demanded is you've moved along the existing demand curve. You're just changing where you're at in the demand schedule. Whereas a change in demand is modeled by the shift of the whole curve. That means that every single price quantity demanded has changed. I've got an entire, an entirely different demand schedule now. Big difference, okay? Big difference. All right. Um, we've talked about substitutes and complements, okay? Used a couple of examples of that. Um, and I talked about inferior and normal goods. Um, so be sure you get the difference. Um, inferior and normal good, that's going to be related to um, income. And substitutes or complements, they typically refer to that as a, uh, a related pro a change in the price of related products. Okay, here is a nice graphical representation of these factors. All right, um, that can shift the demand curve. Okay, so again, this is a rightward shift. That's an increase. The one on the right is a decrease, a leftward shift of my demand curve. Right. And you can see all the nice uh, justifications for why the demand curve has shifted. It might increase if um, a good becomes more popular, um, if the number of consumers increases, if incomes go up and it's a normal good, if a uh, price of a substitute goes up, you're going to shift your consumption preference to the good that it's substituting. A price of a complement falls. You buy them together, the price of a complement falls. You're going to buy more. Uh, law of demand says you're buying more of that good. If they, if you buy them together, you're going to be buying more of this good too. Um, and then future expectations uh, that can encourage buying. Right? You think the the goods going to get more expensive next month? You might go ahead and buy now. Uh, you think your income is going to be less next month? You might go ahead and jump on it now. Um, so, and then similar factors over on the right, kind of in reverse. Right? Taste uh, shift to a good becoming less popular. Uh, fewer consumers, uh, income falls and it's a normal good. They should also over here, they should say income, uh, 
income falls um, for a, this would happen for inferior good. Uh, over on the right hand good, income drops for a normal good would be a decrease, but income drops for an inferior good, excuse me, income uh, uh, drops for an inferior good, uh, uh, rises for an inferior good. If income rises, demand for an inferior good is going to fall. Uh, they should have those there and they don't. So that should be updated. Reflect that. Nonetheless, uh, price of a substitute falls, price of complement rises, and future expectations discourage buying. You're going to have more money next month. You're not going to buy it now. You're going to put it off. You think it's going to go on sale next month. All right? That kind of thing. All right. This brings us to supply. Um, so supply of goods and services. Here again, supply is the relationship between the price of a certain good or service, and how much that good or service producers are willing to sell, right? Um, the law of supply says that the as prices rise, quantity supplied rises. All right? This just means that the more they can sell it for, the more of it they want to make. No surprise there. And uh, here again, there's an important difference to be had between supply and quantity supply. Quantity supply is the total number of units of a good or service producer willing to buy at a specific price, right? Whereas supply is how much they're willing to buy at all these different prices. Um, and it's codified. You don't know exactly where that might be. That's going to vary on a, on a whole host of factors that we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, and likewise, there's that distinction again between a change in supply and a change in quantity supply. Here again, a change in quantity supplied is caused by one thing and one thing only, a change in the price of the underlying good, period. Um, a change in supply is caused by one of seven non-price determinants of supply. We'll see how many the book has, but lists vary. I've had seven. Spells out the word stinger. I'll go through that in a moment. Um, and so, uh, similarly... A change in quantity supplied is, mo is uh, modeled as movement along the existing supply curve, and a change in supply is modeled as a shift in the whole supply curve. So we're going to see that here in a little bit. All right. It's important to understand that supply and quantity supplied is not the same. Demand and quantity demanded is not the same. Um, supply is a reference to the curve. Quantity supplied refers to a specific point on that curve. Demand refers to the demand curve. Quant quantity demanded refers to a specific point on that demand curve. Okay, so here's a supply schedule similar to what we saw. You'll notice again, here's the law of supply writ large. As you move down the first column, you'll notice that the prices are increasing from a dollar to a dollar twenty, dollar forty, dollar sixty. It's increasing at a constant rate. Notice quantity supplied is um, unbelievable. They have the table wrong. Wow. Yeah, this this table is not the one over here. Um, all right, I apologize. I've updated the table to reflect the, cor the correct. Uh, I didn't make these slides. They were they came with a, the textbook. I'm not real happy about uh, the text or Lumen, Lumen Learning necessarily, but uh, uh, that's what we're going to be using, so we'll, we'll push through it. I do apologize. That probably means the slides you have may be these uh, that, that are incorrect there. So you, if you're printing up slides or you have them in front of you now and you're looking at them, update them uh, accordingly, and you can use this right here. These are the amounts. Uh, I just use these amounts. So... Uh, here again, notice the law of supply as price as you move down this column one, you'll notice that prices are increasing by 20 cents increments of 20 cents, right? Constant uh, increase. Um, and then the quantity supplied is likewise increasing. There's the law of supply. As prices rise, quantity supplied rises. This is known as a direct relationship or a positive relationship, okay? Um, and then, of course, the supply curve is a graphical representation of the supply table. Um, and again, here again, more often than not, we're going to draw very generalized supply curves. We're not going to necessarily do a point by point kind of thing. Um, occasionally, but not, not, not as often as you might imagine. All right. Um, what are, what is the single largest effect on supply? Cost of production. Cost of production. Uh, I also took that break to update that and get me, uh, fr freshen my cup of coffee. Um, single biggest factor is the cost of production. There are input resources, those things that we need to make a good or service. Uh, to make a car, you need more steel. Um, you know, to make uh, tires, you need rubber, that sort of thing. Now, it is important to understand. Here's one of those things uh, I'm going to say that may be provocative to some. The single greatest expense 
in terms of production of a good or service? Labor. You and me. All this talk about uh, will will wages keep up with inflation? I got news for you. In wages are inflationary. Salaries are inflationary. All you've done by increasing the cost of labor is increase the cost of making the good. That's it. As price goes up, quantity supplied wants to go up. But remember, it's not just supply you have to worry about. There's demand. Quantity, uh, as price goes up, quantity demand is going to fall. While there's lots of producers who want to make more at a higher price, there's not as many consumers willing to buy it at a higher price. So, um, it's it's a it's a delicate dance here. It's not it's not as simple as everybody wants to make it out to be. And I wish it was that simple, but it's not. This is part of the problem I had when I was studying economics um, at both the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, is it completely uh, completely flipped my thinking in so many ways? Completely blew my worldview out of the water um, because there was no escaping the obvious conclusion. I was wrong on a number of things, um, and this being one of them. Uh, the problem is wages are inflationary. So uh, if you increase the cost of production, it does not matter why it costs what it costs to produce a good or service. Every dime of that cost has to be recovered somehow or another. It has to be. Now, are there companies that are large enough that they can absorb the additional costs? Absolutely. And if that's what you want, knock yourself out. All you're doing is getting rid of smaller businesses in favor of these massive uh multinational, multi-global, multi-billion dollar companies. All right? Um, Amazon, Walmart. If that's, all, if that's all you want, that's fine. But as you knock more, as those, as those markets become less competitive, their ability to control pricing becomes even greater. So be careful what you wish for. It's part of the challenge that we face, right? Um, anyway, so production costs, big. that's the big factor. There are other factors that cause a shift in supply, right? So again, that shift in supply is a change in the quantity of supply at every single price. It's a completely different supply schedule. Once you have a shift, it changes the supply schedule. Whereas a change in quantity supplied is just movement, just moved where, where you were in the, in, in the, on the table, in the supply schedule, right? Where you're at on the existing supply curve, okay? All right, so if a firm faces lower cost of production, um, they can make more. If they face lower, uh, higher cost of production, they make less. It's that simple. So let me put something in, in context for you. Let's look at oil, the price of oil. Look at the oil market, all right? As the supply of oil falls, the price of oil goes up. Um, the problem with this, and this is part of what we're facing now, guess what? Oil is used in the production of a lot of other goods and services. Anything made of rubber is petroleum-based, plastic, petroleum-based, fiberglass. So because the price of oil just went up, guess what? The price of all those goods just went up. Guess what else? Even if it's not used directly as an input resource in the production process, it is indirectly. It's how every good or service gets delivered to the market, isn't it? Need, you need oil to run your vehicles, to deliver those goods and services to the market. That additional cost of delivering goods and services to the market, which costs more now because oil costs more, has to be passed on to the consumer. Most of it, in most cases. Certainly, in, in the case of the smaller the business, the more the more that they got to pass on. It has to be passed right through to the customer. That's the problem we're facing right now. That's why we have inflation. And we will talk a lot more about this when we reach the, uh, aggregate supply and aggregate demand uh, for a macro class. Okay? So, keep this in mind as we work through this material. All right. Um, so, I want to take a pause right here. I want you to notice these arrows. This is a terrible, 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 terrible thing they're doing. Supply curves do not shift up and down. Neither do demand curves for that matter. But here's the reason why you specifically don't want to think supply curve is shifting up and down. We denote 
up as meaning an increase. That is not the case. When that demand curve, when that supply curve shifts to the left, which is a much better way of saying it than shift upward, you actually have a fall in quantity supplied. All right? When, when that supply curve shifts to the left, quantity supplied at every single price is going to be lower than it was. So don't think of don't think of this as upward shifts. Um, these this is a, a terrible way of depicting this. It's haphazard and, uh, and and inappropriate. It's a bad idea. This is hard enough without adding to the confusion for students. This is not an increase in the supply. This is a decrease in the supply. This is a decrease in supply. And that up arrow makes it appear to be an increase. It is not. All right. So here again is a nice summary of the different things that can affect supply. Remember, I said they spell out stinger. So let me go through mine. Different than the book. You can use this or not. Um, S, uh, supply shock. When, when I talked about the supply of oil falling, that's a supply shock. That supply shock and oil ripples, ripples through the rest of the economy. And think of that as like an economic contagion right? Spreads through the rest of the economy. So a supply shock. This also occurs when a, a, an early frost uh, wipes out a citrus crop. Suddenly the number of oranges, the supply of oranges is lower because oranges got destroyed in a freeze. That's a supply shock, okay? That would cause a leftward shift. Supply shocks are almost always adverse. Almost always adverse. Um, second, uh, Stinger, S-T-I-N-G-E-R, T, technology. Supply shocks are almost always adverse, bad. T, technology is almost always a rightward shift, an increase. It almost always makes production more efficient and effective. So usually you're going to uh, um, see uh, technology as an improvement in supply, an increase, a rightward shift. STI, the price of input resources. This is the one I'm telling you. This is the one that is used more often than not as any other example for why supply changes, the shift in supply. Um, any, whatever it is, whatever good they're using. Uh, uh, aluminum in the, is, is an input resource in the production of sodas, Cokes. If the price of aluminum goes up, guess what? The price of making Cokes just went up. Production costs rise. Supply is going to fall to the left, etc. And likewise, if the cost of aluminum falls, comes down, they can, uh, it's not going to cost as much to make. So supply is going to increase, shift to the right. STI in, remember number of consumers from demand? Well, how about number of producers for supply? Company goes out of business, supply curve is going to shift left. There's, fewer, there's less of that good. Um, if new, as new producers come online and start offering it, supply is going to increase. Okay. S-T-I-N-G. G stands for government, government regulations, and there's two of them. Most of you know taxes. Here again, I'm going to say something that is arguably provocative. It's really not. It's common sense once you understand economics. This is another one of those things that completely threw, threw me for a loop. Shouldn't. Makes perfect sense now. Corporate taxes are nothing more than a backdoor tax on you, the consumer. It's nothing more than a politician's trick to, get, to, to take more money from you. That's it. Because you are not taking money from corporations. They're going to recoup that money in the form of higher prices. It does not matter why it costs to make a good or service. Every dime has to be recovered. You add taxes to it, you add to the cost of producing that good, that gets passed on to the customer. Here again, there are some that are big enough to absorb the additional uh, tax cost. Not many. Smaller businesses will have to either go out of business because the bigger businesses don't, they, they can absorb it, put the smaller business out of business because they're going to have to raise their prices. Nobody's going to buy it from them because their stuff just got more expensive. And this company over here, this big giant Amazon or Walmart, their stuff stayed inexpensive, cheaper anyway. You're going to go buy it there. They're out of business. Market share, greater price control. As their market share increases, their ability to affect uh, prices directly increases. Um, it's not a good scenario. You want competition, and you're reducing competition when you uh, when you uh, uh, when you advocate for higher corporate taxes. So, but nonetheless, one of the two things in government regulations we're talking about for this taxes. If corporate taxes go up, increase the cost of production. 
supply curve shifts leftward, decrease. Corporate taxes get cut, they come down, cost of production is less, supply curve shifts to the right, increases. STING, the second government regulation, is something called a subsidy. If you don't know what that is, a subsidy is when basically the government helps offset the cost of production by giving them money. Um, they did this, uh, Obama, for example, President Obama did this with uh, a solar cell company called Solyndra. Um, the problem with solar panels is they were too expensive relative to the current cost of energy through the traditional sources. All right. Um, and so most consumers base consumption on price. As long as energy was less expensive, they're going to stay on uh, over there. So how do we get the price of solar panels to come down? Well, if the government gives them money to make it, then it costs them, the company, less to make it. They're having to spend less of their own money. This means they can offer these solar panels at a lower price and hopefully make it more competitive with traditional forms of energy. Cylindra went out of business. Hmm. C'est la vie. Part of the problems with subsidies is we don't, some would argue you don't want government picking winners and losers in a free market. You don't want them deciding. Oftentimes, who gets subsidized is going to be based less on uh, who needs to be subsidized and more on who gave the most to the politician's re-election campaign fund. Sorry. Yeah, subsidy of government payments to firms to encourage production of some good or service. Reduces the cost of production. It's an increase, right? All right, so those are the two government regulations. Corporate taxes, subsidies. S-T-I-N-G-E expectations. You had expectations of consumers, you got expectations of producers. Okay? Um, and usually that are expectations related to how much it's going to cost them to produce the good or service. And then there is R. S-T-I-N-G-E R. Stinger. R is the, just like you had complements and substitutes in consumption, demand, you have complements and substitutes in production. I don't like this one too much, and it gets presented differently in different textbooks, and some don't use it at all, and I fall into that camp. I typically do not mess around with complements and substitutes in production when I deal with supply and demand because it, it it's not consistently treated um, in these textbooks, and for me, to me anyway. All right, so what do they have? Favorable or poor natural conditions. There's your supply shock. Um, a fall or a rise in input prices, there's your I. Uh, uh, improved or uh, uh, a decline in technology, which again says it's not common. That's what I was talking about. There's STI and right there. And then the lower product taxes, less costly regulations. There's my G, government regulations. They don't have expectations. They don't have uh, substitutes and complements in production. Um, so that's okay. Works out well. All right. Now. Supply, demand, now we're going to talk about equilibrium. Putting these two things together, okay? Um, uh, and where they intersect, that is where equilibrium price is. So you see where, you see the dot that these two, these two curves share. Supply and demand curves share a dot. That dot appears at a price of $1.40 and at a quantity of 600 Does everybody see that? You need to be able to read that. And to do that, it's not hard. We'll start at where the two intersect and just draw a nice dotted line over to the, not perfectly horizontal, over to the vertical axis. Boom. Where it intersects the vertical axis, that's your equilibrium price. Now do likewise. Perfectly horizontal line, straight down. Excuse me. Perfectly vertical line, straight down over to the, uh, to the uh, horizontal axis. Where that intersects, boom. Quantity. There's your equilibrium quantity. And now you don't talk about quantity demanded or quantity supplied per se because you're dealing with both. Now, in a minute, we're going to talk about quantity supplied and quantity demanded in the context of the same graph. Okay? Um, so what happens, for example, when quantity supplied, quantity demanded do not equal one another? At that point of equilibrium, where you have equilibrium quantity, quantity demanded, quantity supplied are the same amount. What happens if that's not the case? What happens if they're being sold at a price that is not the equilibrium rate? We also call that, by the way, the equilibrium price and quantity. That's also known as the market clearing rate. Let's talk about this. This is going to create what we call a supply shortage uh, or surplus. All right. So you'll notice in this first example that um, 
it looks like to me they're setting the price at $1.80. This is above the equilibrium price. So in other words, it is intersecting quantity demanded before as you as you draw from that as you draw a line from that uh, vertical axis all the way over starting at $1.80 on the vertical axis and draw a perfectly horizontal line straight across intersecting both lines you'll see it intersects the demand curve before it intersects the supply curve and quantity is increasing left to right so if you're hitting the demand curve before you hit the supply curve that means that quantity demanded is less than quantity supply in other words at a price higher than the market clearing rate higher than the equilibrium price they're going producers would love to make that much they'd love to sell it to you for a buck 80 there's just not as many consumers willing to buy it at a buck 80 Okay, so uh, this leads to a surplus. Producers made too much, there's too much of it left over because there's not as many consumers willing to buy it at this higher price. You got you got a surplus, excess supply. All right, this is when the quantity demanded is less than quantity supplied, and this occurs at prices uh, above the equilibrium. I don't know why it says below the equilibrium. All right, I fixed it. All right. Um, now you've got a situation um, where they've set the price below equilibrium at $1.20. So to see what this looks like, just take your take this vertical axis where it says $1.20, draw a horizontal, a perfectly horizontal line straight across, preferably dotted so that it doesn't look like a supplier demand curve itself, all the way across to where it intersects both curves. You will notice that it's going to hit your supply curve before it gets to your demand curve. And again, because quantity is increasing as you move left to right, and you hit the supply curve before you hit the demand curve moving left to right, means quantity supplied is less than coin demanded. In other words, there's lots of consumers who would love to buy this at 20 cents cheaper. There's just not as many producers willing to sell it for that much less. So you inevitably end up with excess demand or a shortage. Okay, um, This is when quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied. A surplus occurs when quantity demanded is gr uh, greater than, uh, excuse me, less than quantity supply. And a shortage is when qu quantity demanded is greater than quantity supply. Okay? All right. I don't see any mistakes over here. Let's keep going. All right. So we want to be where these two intersect. That's, that is the mechanism by which, communi uh, which price is being communicated, uh, where how much they sell and how much winner, uh, consumers are willing to buy is the same. Okay. Um, so equilibrium is with price and quantity combination uh, are such that supply and demand are equal. Equilibrium price is the only price where the quantity supplied in a market equals the quantity demanded. And the equilibrium quantity is the quantity both supplied and demanded at that particular price. Okay. All right. Not much here I want to talk about on this one. So I'm just going to move on. Um, four-step process draw your demand and supply curves showing the market before the so how do, how do you how do you show find changes in equilibrium uh, draw a supply and demand curve then model what changed all right was it the price of a good that changed or was it a non-price determinant or a non-price non-price uh, a non-price determinant of demand or non-price determinant of supply because that's going to determine which curve is being affected all right um, you have to you have to figure out which one is it going to be supply or demand Okay, um, and then you have to determine whether the effect on supply and demand is going to be an increase or a decrease in, in those. An increase is going to be a rightward shift of the curve. A decrease will be a leftward shift of the curve, regardless of which curve it is. Leftward decrease, rightward increase. Okay. And I realize I'm opposite. This is my left, but it's not your left. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then and then the, the, when you redraw that curve. To reflect this change that happened, it's going to intersect the other curve at a different place. That's your new equilibrium. How do you find it? Well, draw a where those two intersect now. Again, you draw that dotted line, a perfect horizontal line over to your vertical axis. There's your equilibrium price. All right, and then you draw a perfectly vertical line straight down to intersect with the vertical axis. Excuse me, the horizontal axis. That's your equilibrium quantity where it intersects there. All right. And again, I recommend you use dotted lines for this so that it doesn't become too difficult to distinguish between your supply, demand, and your 
uh, determine and, and what you're trying to find equilibrium price and quantity at. Okay, that's just me. All right. So, um, a pay raise for postal workers. All right, we're talking about wages earlier. Here we are. A pay raise for postal workers. So, a basic supply and demand. Boom, boom. Price here is really going to be more uh, wages, but that's okay. Okay. And then, uh, does a pay raise affect supplier demand? Well, that's co labor cost. Labor is a non-price determinant of supply. So it's going to affect supply. Is it going to increase or decrease supply? Well, it's going to cost more to pr produce this service, this delivery, postal delivery service. So it's going to be a decrease in supply. Supply curve shifts leftward. Notice they did not use the upward arrow here. They showed it left. That's good. Okay. When that happens, price went up. They just new intersection point on the demand curve. Drew that line over to the vertical axis where price is labeled. That's your new equilibrium price. Notice it's higher where the two where these two axes meet at the bottom. That that point of origin that is zero comma zero. That's the point on the on your Cartesian coordinate system. So any movement away from that up or over is going is an increase. Okay, so you'll notice in this case it's intersecting my price axis at a higher point than it had been. That means prices went up. You'll notice on the horizontal axis for quantity, it's intersecting that at a place prior to it where it had intersected it before. That means quantity supplied fell. In this case, you're it's costing more and you're producing less. Okay. Um, demand is that relationship between price and quantity. Quantity demanded, quantity uh, supplied, those are all the, the, the sort of things that we've been talking about, right? This is just kind of a review of those things, okay? All right. And then here's a, a nice review uh, that you can follow up with on, uh, on your own time, okay? Now, that's all I have of this lecture, and I will talk to you all later. Thank you.